Hi, welcome to this lecture for human physiology. We are going to introduce the basics of muscle physiology. Specifically, we're going to look at the different types of muscle tissue, and we're going to look at the anatomy of the skeletal muscle fibers so that we can understand how it would contract or shorten and relax or lengthen. So this lecture is actually going to be broken up into two parts. This first part is really just going to look at the three different types of muscle tissue and then start looking at the anatomy of uh, skeletal muscle. In the second part of this lecture, you're going to learn more about the microscopic anatomy of the skeletal muscle fiber, how it's organized, and what allows it to shorten and lengthen. All right, let's get started. So if you have taken anatomy before, then you know that there are four types of tissues in the body. Those four categories are epithelial tissue, nervous tissue, muscle tissue, and connective tissue. Now, what defines muscle tissue is the ability to contract and lengthen. It is called a contractile tissue type because it can shorten and lengthen. Now, within the designation of muscle tissue, there are actually three subcategories. They are skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. Now, before we get into the skeletal muscle, which is really where we're going to spend most of our time for this module, I first want to go through how the three muscle types differ. So we're going to do that by making a table. I encourage you to pause the video and copy this table down with enough room to write some answers in. So go ahead. All right, now let's go ahead and start filling in the cells. We're going to start by looking at where they're located in the body. So skeletal muscle is located exactly where it says it's located, attached to the skeleton or the bones. So skeletal muscle gets its name because it is almost exclusively attached to bones, although there's a few examples where muscle can kind of attach to other muscle. Largely, we're looking at attachment to bones. And again, if you have been through anatomy, you know this so well. In fact, you probably hope to unknow all of the different origins and insertions. And those, of course, are the attachment places for those muscles. All right, the cardiac muscle is exactly where it says it's going to be, the heart. Now, smooth muscle is a little bit more diverse, and we can summarize by saying smooth muscle largely is going to coat internal tubes in the body. So, of course, structure relates to function. So let's take a look at what these types of tissues do. So we know they shorten and lengthen, but why? So for skeletal muscle, we know that skeletal muscle is attached to the bone, and so its job is to move the bones or move the skeleton. So it is responsible for motor function or movement. Cardiac muscle causes the heart to change shape. And you might say, well, it causes the heart to beat. But why do you have a beating heart? You have a beating heart so you can circulate blood around the body. So the purpose of cardiac muscle is actually to move blood. Now, smooth muscle, again, is a little bit more broad. Some smooth muscle is coating your blood vessels. And when that happens, usually the purpose of the smooth muscle is to change the diameter of the blood vessel. So if you have a blood vessel and you contract it or you contract the smooth muscle around it, you're actually going to compress the blood vessel and therefore shorten or reduce the diameter of that blood vessel. So you can actually shrink that blood vessel down by contracting the smooth muscle around it. Now, if you let that smooth muscle relax and you can let that blood vessel open back up, you'll increase the diameter of that blood vessel. So we're going to learn about what that does later on in cardiovascular physiology. But for now, just understand that smooth muscle is going to change the diameter of tubes. Now, if the smooth muscle is lining something like the digestive system, then you get these kind of rapid successions of contractions and relaxation that is responsible for what is known as peristalsis, which is movement of food through the digestive system. So again, a little bit more of a broad um, description in terms of function for smooth muscle. 
So now we get into the anatomy of these different types. Now, if you've been through anatomy already, this is going to be review. But if you haven't, you should definitely write some of this down. So skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle both fall under a category known as striated muscle. Striated muscle is one that has like a banding pattern to it. So it has a light, dark, light, dark uh, look to it under a microscope. Whereas smooth muscle is not striated. In fact, that's where the term smooth comes from, is that under a microscope, it doesn't look choppy. It looks kind of continuously the same color. In addition, some of the muscle cells are long and some are short. So skeletal muscle cells are actually quite long. They can be as long as a bone, which is pretty darn long for a single cell. And of course, they're striated. Cardiac muscle is going to also be striated, but it's much shorter. And smooth muscle is going to be short and non-striated. So let's take a look at some pictures of each of these so that you can see this in more detail. So first we have our skeletal muscle. And you can see in this image that we have long cells. In fact, you might notice that there's more than one nucleus per long cell. But you can clearly see the banding pattern. So this is striated, long, with multiple nuclei. And I'll talk about that momentarily. Cardiac muscle, upon first glance, looks a whole lot like skeletal muscle. But then you see that there's these extra lines in there. And that is because cardiac muscle cells are not long, but rather short. They look kind of like a rectangle. I'm going to use my cursor here and outline one. So there's one cardiac muscle cell. And so rather than have one long continuous cell, what cardiac muscle does is it takes a cell and then puts another cell right behind it and another cell right behind that. And so it makes these cells kind of uh, sit together in tandem and they are connected by these dark regions that are marked by the arrows and those are called intercalated discs. Now we have learned that intercalated discs are rich in two types of intracellular junctions, both gap junctions and anchoring junctions. All right? You'll also notice that while these are short, they generally also have only one nucleus in them, like a typical cell would. All right, finally we get into smooth muscle. So smooth muscle does not have that banding pattern. They are called spindle-shaped cells, and you can see they have some pretty substantial tapering there at the end, and they also have a single nucleus in them. All right, so now let's go ahead and write down the number of nuclei per cell. Cardiac and smooth has a single nucleus, usually, whereas skeletal muscle cells are multinucleated. Now, skeletal muscle cells are multinucleated because mature skeletal muscle cells are actually the product of the fusion of multiple embryonic cells. So in order to create one long cell, you don't start with a little one that just grows outward like you might expect, but rather you get a bunch of cells and you kind of mold them together. So think about an individual cell being like a little tiny piece of Play-Doh in it with a marble. And so that would be one embryonic cell. Well, to create a full skeletal muscle cell, all of these little embryonic cells get fused together. And so it would be rolling all of the Play-Doh, little Play-Doh pieces together to create one long cell. But since they each bring their own marble, the marbles are retained. So the nuclei are like the marbles. So consequently, skeletal muscle cells are in fact multinucleated because each embryonic cell brought its own nucleus and then each nucleus was retained. Okay, so now we talk about what controls whether or not each type of muscle tissue is going to shorten or lengthen. So what are some options? Well, we could have the nervous system. And if the nervous system is in control, then we would need to have some sort of efferent neuron plug in to that muscle cell. Uh, we could be responsive to certain hormones, or we could be responsive to some sort of local paracrine. So let's see how these map out. So skeletal muscle is going to be under the control of the somatic nervous system. So cardiac muscle 
is going to be under the control of the autonomic nervous system. And recall that the autonomic nervous system is further broken down into sympathetic and parasympathetic. In addition, there are molecules that function as hormones that also can impact the cardiac muscle. I'm going to talk about that actually in just a few minutes. So save that idea that hormones might be involved for the next slide. All right, and finally, smooth muscle. So what the smooth muscle responds to depends really on where the smooth muscle is. Around some of the major blood vessels, the smooth muscle is largely responsive to the autonomic nervous system. Again, which means that you have neurons that are plugged in or what are called synapsed to those muscle cells. And just like cardiac, there are sometimes some hormones that can also play a role on smooth muscle. But in addition, some smooth muscle actually responds to local control. So these are gonna be cell signaling molecules that are around in the local area that impact the uh, contraction or relaxation of the smooth muscle. So we'll see examples of this, um, particularly in the respiratory system and the immune system. We'll see how local control can impact smooth muscle. Okay, so now that we've covered that, I need to emphasize that we're really gonna be spending all of our time looking at the skeleton. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is come back to this idea of the autonomic nervous system and hormones. So I wanna talk a little bit about the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is fight or flight. And the major neurotransmitter that is released from sympathetic efferent neurons is going to be something called norepinephrine. And you can see a picture of norepinephrine here. Now, there is an analog or a very similar molecule that is also functions in a very similar way to norepinephrine, and that is epinephrine. So epinephrine is very similar to norepinephrine. They are used largely the same way. There are some nuances in terms of how um, the receptors might respond to them. Some like epinephrine more than they like norepinephrine and vice versa. But what we're gonna do is kind of briefly define them. So epinephrine is used mostly as a hormone and it is released from the adrenal glands. And the adrenal glands is going to be this kind of fatty gland that's on top of the renal system or the kidneys, hence the term adrenal to add to the kidney system. So the adrenal glands are going to release epinephrine as a hormone into the bloodstream. This is also known as adrenaline whereas the sympathetic nervous system largely releases norepinephrine as a neurotransmitter. So if we go back to our understanding of neurophysiology, we know that neurotransmitters are meant to basically be paracrines that diffuse across the synaptic cleft, bind to a receptor on the other side, and enact some sort of response. So norepinephrine is usually released as the neurotransmitter for the sympathetic nervous system, and epinephrine is usually released as a hormone. But those lines are not completely clear. It is not a black and white thing. Epinephrine can also be used as a neurotransmitter, and norepinephrine can be secreted into the bloodstream as a hormone. So what I want you guys to understand is that norepinephrine and epinephrine kind of do the same thing. They're both acting like sympathetic agents that are gonna activate that fight or flight response. They can be used interchangeably, but the rule is that norepinephrine is more of the neurotransmitter and epinephrine is more of the hormone. So when I say the cardiac and the smooth muscle are under both autonomic and some hormonal control, I'm really specifically talking about these two, where norepinephrine is usually going to be secreted by the efferent neurons of the sympathetic nervous system, and epinephrine is usually secreted as a hormone, but they can act on similar receptor types and sometimes even the same receptor types and enact the same types of responses. So I like to collectively refer to them as my adrenalines, 
even though technically adrenaline really refers to epinephrine. All right, now that I've gone down that little rabbit hole, I'm gonna pull back and start talking about skeletal muscle. So in this class, I do not really talk about smooth muscle other than what we already did. Instead, we're gonna spend most of our time looking at the physiology of skeletal muscle. So to understand the physiology of skeletal muscle, we need to understand the anatomy of skeletal muscle. So let's start with the big picture. We are going to start by looking at a skeletal muscle, which is an organ. So if you've taken anatomy, you've had to memorize these names like biceps brachii, um, trapezius, deltoid, that kind of stuff. So that each skeletal muscle represents an organ. And so the skeletal muscle is shown here. Now, if you cut open a skeletal muscle and you start looking at it, you'll realize that there's actually these bundles that are embedded within each skeletal muscle. Those bundles are known as fascicles. And then when you open up a fascicle and start looking inside there, you'll realize there's actually really small, long cells that comprise a fascicle. So the individual cells, we really should call them muscle cells, but unfortunately we call them fibers. And I say unfortunately because if you've taken anatomy, you're used to the term extracellular fiber, which does not mean cell. It means something totally different like collagen or elastin or reticular fibers. It's some part of the extracellular matrix. It's not a cell. Yet here, we're using the word muscle fiber to mean muscle cell. I don't know why. Muscle physiologists just kind of went with their own language. So if I use the word fiber, which I will use pretty much from here on out, it means a muscle cell. So muscle fiber equals muscle cell. Write it down, star it, highlight it, get used to it. Okay, so again, looking at our arrangement, we have individual muscle fibers that get kind of arranged in a parallel format and then bundled up. Those are called a fascicle. And then a bunch of fascicles wrapped up in a big um, wrapping is called a skeletal muscle. Okay, so now let's take a look at the microscopic anatomy. In other words, once we get into a single muscle fiber, that's one cell, what do we see? And if you look at this cutaway here, you'll see it looks nothing like a traditional cell. In fact, where are all of our organelles that we're used to seeing? Where's the mitochondria and the endoplasmic reticulum and all that stuff? It's just different. So skeletal muscle fibers are uh, structured incredibly differently than typical cells are. Now that said, there's still some vestigial um, organelles that get repurposed for other functions. So let's take a look at what they are. So this outer layer here that you're gonna see that I've drawn with the arrow is the plasma membrane. But when we talk about skeletal muscle fibers, we don't call it the plasma membrane, we give it a different name. It is called the sarcolemma. So sarcolemma and plasma membrane mean the same thing for a skeletal muscle fiber. Now, in fact, you should get used to a couple of prefaces that generally mean muscle, and they are either sarco or myo. So if you see M-Y-O, myo, that probably implies something to do with muscles. And if you see sarco, that implies muscles. So both of those imply something to do with skeletal muscle fibers. Okay. So now we see that when we look inside of our uh, fiber, that we have all of these tiny rods in there. And in fact, one of them is being pulled out. In fact, the entire fiber looks packed full of these rods. Well, those rods are known as myofibrils. So myofibrils are going to be stacked inside a skeletal muscle fiber. In fact, when we arrange a skeletal muscle fiber, it's really gonna try and pack as many of those myofibrils in as it can. And I like to think of myofibrils as like coffee straws. And I think about like shoving as many coffee straws as I can into a packaging about this big. And so you could just imagine them all laying in parallel there. So lots of myofibrils. And then there's some other funky stuff. So what's this blue thing that seems to be covering each individual myofibril. Well, that is repurposed endoplasmic reticulum.
And so the purpose is going to be discussed in another lecture, but because it is in a muscle fiber and does not do the typical endoplasmic reticulum function, we give it a special name called sarcoplasmic reticulum. So sarcoplasmic reticulum is an organelle, and what it is is it's kind of this like lacy package that surrounds each myofibril. So if you have a myofibril, you're going to kind of package it around like this with the sarcoplasmic reticulum. All right, and then we get these yellow things that look a whole lot like what I, th at least what I think of our ant farm tracks. So if you've ever had an ant farm before, you get two pieces of glass or plexiglass, and then there's some dirt down there at the bottom, and then the ants make these tracks in, and that's to me is kind of what this looks like, but it's pretty structured. So you can see that these tubes actually start um, at the sarcolemma, and then they invaginate in. Well, interestingly enough, that is just plasma membrane that has actually, so you start at the surface and then you pop in. That's just plasma membrane that invaginates in. And its goal is to wrap around the myofibrils multiple times, as you can see. So those are called T-tubules, and the T stands for transverse, which means to cross. So these are tubules that start at the surface of the cell and then cross through the other side, or cross through to the other side of the cell. They transverse the cell, hence the term T-tubules. You'll also notice the nucleus is up off to the left and out of the way. Normally, we think of the nucleus as being pretty centralized to the cell, but here it's an afterthought. It's like, get out of the way, get out of the way. And that is because a nucleus is really big and bulky, and guess what? This cell wants to maximize its space for myofibrils. So the goal is to maximize the space for the myofibrils, and everything else either gets, gets kind of pushed off to the side, including the nuclei. Okay. So the last thing that I'm going to end this with is a look at muscle contractions. So if I have a skeletal muscle fiber and in, there's a bunch of individual myofibrils in there, it turns out that the myofibrils are actually what are shortening and lengthening. So when we think about a muscle contraction, like your biceps contracting or your triceps contracting as shown here, What's really happening is the individual muscle cells or muscle fibers are shortening. Well, how does that happen? The myofibrils within those muscle fibers shorten. So that means that to understand the physiology of how a muscle contracts, we're going to need to take a look at the myofibrils, learn their anatomy, and then see if we can figure out how they can shorten and lengthen. But that's going to be saved for the second part of this lecture.